if you've decided to work with a co-writer on your next novel, we need to make sure both you and your co-writer are legally protected as you start this process to make sure that it's easy, streamlined, everything is spelled out so that nobody has any questions or any issues, and that your friendship or working relationship stays healthy throughout the entire process. Which is why today we are bringing back everyone's favorite IP and entertainment lawyer, Tony, to break down a really engaging conversation that might just be one of my favorites that I've had with Tony so far here on the channel to help make sure that you have a healthy working relationship with your co-authors as you move forward. Let's jump in. My name is Tony Ali Costas. I'm an adjunct professor of entertainment law and IP at New York Law School. And I have an Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube account called The IP Professor that is dedicated to discussing all things intellectual property. Recently, you and I had a conversation about working with ghostwriters and the contracts we need in place to make sure we're protecting ourselves. But similar to that, and even more common, is working with a co-writer. That is where two or more authors are pairing up together. They are splitting the work on writing their stories, and they are publishing these together and then splitting their royalties. And one of the things we need to be mindful of is not just entering into these relationships without legal protections. So it's incredibly important to make sure that we have contracts in place before we start working on our co-writing relationship with another person. So Tony, what do we need to know about these contracts? So you can cover a, a bevy of different aspects um, or clauses rather in these, in these contracts. Obviously, you know, I've talked about it before in previous videos wrap and warranty clauses, indemnification clauses. But I think the most important clause in these types of agreements are the, um, it's definitely gonna be the question about copyright ownership. In copyright law, it's understood that whoever is, you know, drawing the picture or behind the camera, pressing the shutter button or behind the camera capturing video, they are the copyright owner. But there is a world where there could be two copyright owners or your three copyright owners. There could be even a corporation that owns copyright. So certainly when you're working with a, another author or maybe multiple authors, understanding the, the division of labor um, is one, one aspect of it, like, you know, how, how the royalty split is going to be for all those authors. But tangentially to that, understanding what is going to be the understanding when it comes to copyright ownership. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's pretty basic. It's really not uh, too fanciful. All you would need is some type of clause that lays out that uh, as these co-writers are working together, um, it's going to be understood that whatever completed product comes of it, uh, they will both be the copyright owners and they will then take their work and register it in the U.S. Copyright Office. And that's the way you cement copyright ownership, right? Uh, you know, under copyright law, the moment you create something, you are the copyright owner. That's There's no dispute. But in any situation where there is a copyright infringement claim, you can't bring the claim unless you have copyright ownership. And I'm a big advocate of registration for a copyright registration for a number of reasons. One, it is so cheap to register a copyright. Just to give you an idea, on average, it's about $55 to $65 to register a copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office for just one work. Meanwhile, to register a trademark, which is also important as well, to register a trademark, it could be 300, I think the last number I checked was uh, $325 to $375, depending on what type of application you're filing. Either you have all the, you have everything ready, you can, and you just provide it to the US Patent and Trademark Office, it's $325, or it's $375, you just put in the application now and you provide the materials later on down the road. So $325, that number, $325 to $375 versus $55 on average. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that's that's a very good investment there. Different. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think beyond like, you know, the how cheap and cost effective it is, again, you're putting people on notice that not only you, but your partner, whoever you work with co-writing the, the book are the copyright owners. So now there is no dispute. Nobody can speculate it whatsoever. And then third, most importantly, you know, I know that in the literary community, plagiarism is very much a thing. So what better way to protect yourself than to have that copyrighted work registered somebody else infringes on your copyright now you have you and your co-writer can pursue a viable copyright infringement claim with ease because you registered the copyright and one other thing i should have mentioned copyright registration the process is fairly quick three months usually from soup to nuts to get a copyright registration certificate in the mail versus the u.s patent and trademark office it literally takes them up to 13 months just to even look at your application they're oh. so backlogged. And again, trademark registration is important 
but comparing the two between how the trademark office handles those applications versus the copyright office, it's a no-brainer to really take seriously copyright registration. And when you're working with a co-writer, that it, that makes it all the more important because then also you don't want bad blood, you don't want any right. hiccups. It, it it cements the ownership right and it, it settles it once and for all. And I think you said it really well. We do not want bad blood when it comes to a co-author relationship. We want to make sure no matter what happens in the future with friendships, with working relationships, that using this particular book that we are working on together will go forward with legal protection and making sure everybody is happy and understands what everyone's job is within this. So having that copyright language in a contract is incredibly important. But I'm a big advocate of laying out everything inside of contracts. If I'm going into a contract with somebody in a co-working relationship, I want to make sure that I have everything possible covered because people can make a lot of plans, people can make a lot of promises, and then if it's not in writing, they may not actually come to fruition. So for me, I love to make sure that we're covering absolutely everything. Things that come to mind for me would be work schedules and timelines and monetary investments. So let's talk a little bit about some of these important things to make sure that we are protected so that we don't have surprises on the back end of this deal. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think you you know provided a very eloquently, Cam. It, it's th there's a lot more to co-writing than just writing the book together, right? It's understanding what what um, if you're working with a publisher and you get an advance for just submitting the first draft, uh, how do you split that? Is it going to be a 70-30 relationship? Is it going to be 60-40, 50-50? Obviously, you would hope it's 50-50 you know, in that situation. Yeah. But either way, you know, don't work off of speculation in that front. So then you have that. Then what about the royalties for every sale of a book? How what the, What's the split going to be for something like that? Um, you know, you mentioned about uh, obligations and, and creating schedules. Who's going to write what chapter and who's going to write, uh, you know, what section? What are the due dates for those? So I think laying out the duties and the obligations in a contract, actually beyond it being prov providing some type of legal protection, I also think it creates good checks and balances and it creates accountability. You're, yes. it's, it's almost like, um, like we always have like that, that stereotypical image of like working in a group when we're in the third grade and the, there are like four kids that are like off to side, not lifting a finger, but there's that one kid that literally put the whole project on their, yeah, me too, put the whole project <laughs> yeah. on their back, right? You were the one that made the poster board. You were the one that stayed up writing the report. You did all the work with an agreement, with a license agreement that lays out those permissions. You know, it's, it's just a way of creating that accountability and, this is where kind of things can get awkward. Let's say you're co-writing a book with a best friend and you're like, you know, you're, you're, you have compatibility. You've been friends for a long time. If you were to give them an agreement that lays out those terms, they might be a little bit insulted, but they shouldn't take it as an insult. It's again, just a way of creating obligations and creating a line in the sand that you're going to do this and I'm going to do that. So it, it's, I think that people that feel hesitant about having those terms materialize in an agreement shouldn't because you don't know if in the future there's going to be a legal dispute that arises primarily because of that. Your, you know, your friend could sue you for breach of contract because you didn't fulfill your duties. And then you can say, well, hold on a second. The agreement said that I had to do this and I did everything there. So you're basically, you know, covering yourself in, in a legal dispute in the future. And, you know, I think it's really interesting because we can feel very uncomfortable if we are trying to work with someone like our friend offering some of these terms that might feel like it's a little bit harsh or a little bit distrusting of those people. My mindset is that, yes, it protects me, but by offering those terms, it also protects the best friend that I'm trying to work with. That gives them this assurance that I will uphold my end of things. Exactly. And so I think it's really important to make sure that we've got that in there to cover me, to cover them, to cover everyone that is involved with that. But one question I do want to talk about a little bit is that once we have these terms laid out, here's the schedule, here's the money we're investing, here's what everybody is doing. Those are all really important things to have in there. But what do we do about consequences for those things? Do we include, if you do not adhere to this, this is what happens? And to what extent do we add that? So there are, uh, in plenty of contracts, there are different types of remedies clauses um, where like in the event of a breach of contract, what happens? I'm a, a huge advocate of what are called cure clauses. Essentially what a cure clause says, they're also called like no equitable relief, but a cure clause essentially means if I made a mistake or if my co-writer made a mistake, 
mea culpa, I got 30 days to fix it, or I've got 15 days to fix the error. It's a mitigation tactic that prevents it arising to a more serious legal claim. That could be by way of an arbitration, a mediation, even an actual full-fledged legal claim that goes before a judge. And, you know, again, the theme before of like, you don't want bad blood with your co-writer, that is a way of preventing that bad blood from happening. You're literally providing an out from it, the, the, the dispute or the disagreement in that agreement that, that arises out of that agreement to rise to that level. So I, I'm a firm believer of mitigation because at the end of the day, this community that we work in, especially in the entertainment industry, and I'm sure for you, you can speak for, for the author industry as well, Cam, it, a lot of these industries are, it, it's, it's really like, it's a small world. You don't, yeah. someone knows somebody else who knows somebody else. Yeah. Why burn bridges? Why yes. uh, have, uh, why have animosity build up uh, where you don't have, you know, where you don't need to have it. I think having those types of cure clauses are one, you know, I, I think it's one perfect example of, you know, not burning a bridge. You provide, you acknowledge a mistake and you take a moment to fix that mistake and no harm, no foul. So I, I think that that's a, a very effective way to, uh, to, to remedy a matter. Now, of course, if you exercise the cure clause, if it's, if it's uh, exists, if it exists in the agreement between you and your co-writer, if there's a cure clause that exists and it's not exercised within the time period, and mm -hmm. you even provide like another grace period that not even laid out in the contract, then I guess at that point you really have no choice but to pursue uh, a breach of contract claim. And at that mm -hmm. point, it's a matter of working with your attorney to figure out what would be the valuation of damages. Sometimes it would be statutory damages. You may be able to employ punitive damages, but that might be extremely hard to do. Um, it, there are a number of different factors there, but certainly uh, there is a way to seek a remedy if you've exhausted literally all options. Um, it, but I, I, like I said, mitigation has been the way I've worked in the yeah. IP field. And I feel like it's a it it puts people in a better mood than if you're going to act combative right off the bat. And I feel like that's really important because we are trying to maintain those friendships, those working relationships, and our standing within the community. Is there anything else we need to make sure is in our contract before we go into a co-writing relationship? I, I think just making sure. I've, I know I've talked about this in previous videos, but uh, the essence of contracts are having a meeting of the minds. So I think working with your co co-writer to know. Uh, to understand that they're okay with those terms and that they're meeting you at the bargaining table just as much as you're meeting them. So you don't want the, these co-writing agreements to operate like unilateral agreements where it's only your demands, what you want, and that's it. You have There has to be a little bit of give and take here. So if you have certain needs and your co-writer has certain needs, negotiating through those terms and cementing it in a, in a legal document that's that's going to breed a really good, healthy work environment between the two of you as you go about doing your co-writing experience. So understanding that contracts are about meeting of the minds and having that mindset going forward, that's imperative in the process, not just in this contract setting, but certainly in any contract setting. And, you know, I really love that thought process because it is a meeting of the minds. It's bringing both sides and their thoughts and their feelings into one documentation. I would actually put forward to the industry that it might be wise to work together to build this contract and to outline the things that are important to you inside of this contract with the mindset of what would we want in this contract if we brought another party into this? If the two of us were going to work with a third party, what do we need to cover for that? Now let's hold ourselves to those standards. And as we're creating these contracts, we know it's incredibly important to not do it ourselves. We are not legal experts. We want to make sure that this is actually legally properly taken care of. So it's incredibly important to make sure we are bringing in a trained either um, entertainment lawyer or publishing lawyer to make sure these things are covered for us. So speak to us on making sure we get a good lawyer for this. You need a lawyer. <laughs> actually, there I, I found on TikTok um, uh, Cardi B saying, get a lawyer, get a lawyer for everything. And <laughs> Here I am saying it in Cardi B's voice. Yep. It's like the wish.com Cardi B voice. But yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's honestly so important to have a lawyer on deck with reviewing the contracts. If even when we talked about, when I talked earlier about uh, cure clauses and you need to exercise those, maybe having your lawyer on deck say, hey, listen, you know, my co-writer didn't satisfy these duties. I'm just calling you to, you know, so you can start warming up in the event that something does arise, but this is what's in the works. You know, 
if it does rise to the breach of contract uh, dispute, having your lawyer look at the contract, it, it, you know, it, that hopefully they drafted is going to be a paramount process, uh, p- paramount uh, part of the process. So um, it, it really cannot stress it enough. We've repeated it over and over on different videos I've done yeah. here together. It, having a lawyer, you know, help you, work with you, uh, review every contract clause at play. If your co-writer is giving you an agreement that you didn't have a hand in drafting, having your own lawyer look at it is also important as well. It, it legal legal representation, I think, has gotten a bad rap too many times. <laughs> But this is the one time where you really have to you have to give it to lawyers because they, they they've dealt with so many contracts or they've dealt in the transactional sense in so many settings. I'm sure that a publishing lawyer could have war stories to share with you that replicate a scenario that you're dealing with. So trust them because they're not. I mean, certainly there are some lawyers that um, don't come in with the best intentions, best of intentions, but more of them are coming in helping advocate on your behalf. That's the whole essence of being a lawyer. You go to law school to be an advocate for the people. And certainly that's the role that a lawyer would play here when they're working with you through the contract phase, through the negotiation phase, through the dispute resolution phase, if it got to that point, through every aspect of the the co-writing experience. Now, when it comes to working with a lawyer for these contracts, is it acceptable? Is it okay or is it a good idea for a co-writing pair to work with one lawyer or is it important for each of them to have their own individual lawyer to look it over? I know that gets touchy on feelings, but what is best practices with that? I think it's really going to depend on the relationship between the co-writers. If we're talking about like best friends and they have the shared vision, I think them jointly going to one lawyer, I think creates like this visual that they're in it together and they're not really like acting in, in a, in an adversarial way, if you will. But if one co-writer approach, approaches another co-writer that, you know, one doesn't know the other from Adam and they say, let's write a book together. Yes. Then in that scenario, having your own independent lawyers work out that process is important. So I think it's circumstantial. It, may, it really may depend on the camaraderie that exists between those co-writers. Either one is fine. I don't think there's one right or wrong answer, but I think it's it's more of a circumstantial situation rather than like a plain, you know, plain vanilla black and white scenario. So making good decisions for you and your co-writer is absolutely essential for your success in this and making sure that you realize you're in this together. You are in the same boat. You're working toward the same goal and you are not adversaries in this is really going to help you to grow and make sure that your contract is protecting both of you so that you can thrive in this working relationship. If you have questions on any of this, drop them down below. We will be paying attention to these. And as always, you can go hang out with Tony online where he's also answering questions and dropping incredible content to help you grow. Tony, where can everybody find? you uh, you can find me on instagram tiktok and youtube at the ip professor and as cam said i have a bunch of videos related to ip and i'm happy to answer any questions you have co-writing is all about bringing out the best in each other and really working together to build each other up and thrive in this industry if you have questions about the legal side of working with a co-writer drop those down below and if you have questions about working with a co-writer in general feel free to ask process questions down below as well hit that subscribe and notification bell because we are not done with episodes from tony he's coming back with his legal mind to make sure that we are protected and safe inside of the publishing and writing industries and we're dropping daily videos to help you level up on the social platforms in the writing and publishing industry and make sure that you are thriving as an author in growing your platforms in a very easy and simple way that takes all the stress and work out of it. Drop your questions below and we'll see you in the next episode.